It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. It was the spring of hope, but also the winter of despair. This is the French Revolution. The French Revolution is probably one of the most important revolutions in world history. It shattered the idea of medieval monarchies with absolute power, and brought France, and the rest of the world, into the postmodern era. But it would take 10 years of violence, anarchy, and civil war to do so. And it all starts in 1756, with the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War was a world war before it was cool, and pretty much everyone in Europe, America, and even parts of Asia took part, and France lost badly. They lost all the territories in North America, 200,000 soldiers, as well as getting 8 billion livres into debt. The guy that started and ended the war, King Louis XV, needed to tax his nobles, but it wasn't going to be easy, because to pay for the war, he gave the nobles tax exemption. And now they weren't going to give it up so easily, especially because the people that were nobles were people that bought their offices. So the richest people in France didn't pay taxes. He tries to push a bill through the parliament, but the parliament says no. This goes on for about 10 years, and he finally gets the nobles to pay taxes, but it wouldn't last long because five years later, King Louis XV would be dead, and the 19 year old Louis XVI would be put on the throne instead in 1774. Louis got convinced by his nobles that, you know, maybe you should scrap that thing about us paying taxes. Um, and because he was 19 and very impressionable, Louis said okay. But he was still in debt, and he needed a way to get out of it. His finance minister saw an opportunity. When in 1776, some farmers in the New World revolted against the British, because they didn't want to pay taxes on stamps and tea. Necker says to Louis, we could get into this war and we'll get so much money from the war reparations that we can pay off our loans and our debt and it'll be so quick that we don't even have to pay interest on the loan. Except the war in America wouldn't be short and it would last eight years. But by 1789 the jig was up and they weren't just in debt, they were broke. So Louis says to his nobles, I'm going to tax you for an unknowable amount, for an unknowable amount of time, until I'm out of debt. The nobles said, fine, but... And then Louis said, I'm going to tax all French citizens at a rate of 5%. A noble stands up and says, We don't mind being taxed until you're out of debt, but if you're going to tax everyone in the kingdom, you're going to have to call the Estates General. The Estates General was a convening of the three estates of France, the clergy, the nobles, and everyone else. It hadn't been called for almost 200 years at this point, and it was getting a bit old, so nobody really knew how to run one. So the finance minister says, send me some ideas on how I'm supposed to run this. And so people in the third estate sent some ideas. A priest called Emmanuel C.S. heard that the Estates General was going to be called, and he published a pamphlet, What is the Third Estate? He writes in the pamphlet, What is the Third Estate? The third estate is everything. What has it done politically until now? Nothing. What does it want to be? Something. This first and second estates are unnecessary. We are 90% of the population and we pay all the taxes. We should at least get double the amount of voting power at this convention and we should vote by head. Because the clergy would get one vote, the nobles would get one vote and the third estate would get one vote. But the third estate noticed that if the clergy and the nobles agreed on something, they could just basically monopolise it and they wouldn't even have to consult the third estate and because the third estate was 95% of the population, that seemed a tad unfair. This gets really popular and Louis talks to his nobles. It's the 5th of May and the delegates from all three estates arrive at Versailles. On the first day, they all gather in a courtyard near the palace and Necker makes a good speech. Now Necker is a really good financier, but he's not a good orator. He spends most of the speech flipping through ledgers, talking in really technical economic terms about the budget that nobody understood. And he didn't even address the idea of whether people would vote by head or vote by order, and the third estate were getting a bit mad. Everyone comes into the palace the next day, and it all kicks off. The estates go into their separate rooms to verify that everybody actually at the convention was voted in, 
and the third estate doesn't really know what to do. They haven't done this before, and they're stuck in their room for two hours without guidance. So what do they do? They pick up their copies of what is the third estate, and start making some speeches. The third estate go, well, we should invite the other two estates to join us because we're not three orders, we're a national body. The second estate says, no, we're fine, thanks. But the first estate was different. The first estate wasn't just archbishops, they were made up of all the members of the church, the majority of which were parish priests, that are, have more in common with the third estate. And so they joined the third estate. After the priests join, the third estate does something radical. They declare themselves the only legitimate assembly in France. Well, we need a name befitting our new status. How about we call ourselves the National Assembly? The fancy archbishops that are still in the first estate run to the king and said, you know that third estate just declared itself the only legitimate body in France. I think you need to reassert some order. The king says, don't worry, I'll sort it all out. A few weeks pass and it's the 23rd of June. The third estate goes to their usual room but they're stopped by some soldiers saying the king says you can't come in. The National Assembly, thinking they're all about to be massacred, books the palace and they need to find a room to hold them all. And they walk about two blocks down the road until they find a tennis court where they swear the tennis court oath. They will never separate, they will never break up, they will continue to meet wherever the circumstances may be until the king is restrained by a constitution. Louis was pissed. Now, throughout all this, he hasn't really been doing much because on June 2nd, his son died. While it was more common for parents to have their kids die, it's still a traumatic experience. So Marie Antoinette, noticing that her husband's not really focusing on what's happening, she goes behind Louis's back and calls in the Minister of War. We need to stop the National Assembly and we need to fire that Swiss commoner, Jacques Necker. And slowly, over the first week of July, the soldiers in the city go from about 8,000 to 20,000. And the citizens of Paris started to notice. The people were scared and they were hungry. They heard what happened when the third estate got kicked out of their room. And they thought, Jesus, they're going to crack down on us too. A bunch of common soldiers that had lived through the bad harvest last year, and had more in common with the actual people of the city than the army, decided we need to create a militia to defend ourselves against the king. And on the 12th of July, they create the National Guard. And a day later, they proclaim this guy called Lafayette, you may have heard of him, as the leader of the guards. The next day, on the 14th of July, they decide they need to get guns. They storm an old retirement home for veterans called Les Invalides, and then get all the guns. But then they realised they needed gunpowder. Where was the store of gunpowder in Paris? It was in the Bastille, an ancient fortress that was said to hold political prisoners of the king and there were supposed to be dead bodies hanging on the walls. The people thought, yes, finally, we can liberate some people that have been terrorised by the king and they stormed the fortress and killed the captain there. But it wasn't what they were led to believe. See, the people that actually went in the Bastille were often nobles that just got their family too ticked off and Louis said, I'll send them to prison for you. And they just pretended it was all really horrible just to up their street cred. The next day, Louis wakes up and he hears the news. The Bastille has been stormed and the governor has been killed. Louis asks, is it a revolt? The Duke replies, no sir, it's a revolution. Louis panicked. He said, what do I do? What do I do? I've got to call in the army to restore order in Paris. But the army was also angry. When Louis had to cut down on expenses at the start of all this, he also cut down the army. He cut down the amount of officers and made it so only nobles could be higher than captains. And those guys that controlled the 200,000 soldiers in Paris had their pensions cut. So the soldiers and their commander were pretty likely to revolt. The king's advisors say to Louis, look, you've got the whole city of Paris in revolt. Do you really want the army to revolt as well? And you've got nothing else to put it down with. Withdraw them from the city. Speaking of the city, everyone outside it was still starving in their huts in the countryside. 
When they heard the news that the guys in the National Assembly didn't even talk about what the peasants wanted, they were angry and they were so hungry they had nothing to lose. They attacked the noble houses, got inside and burned the records of their debts the peasants owed, and the rich nobles owned rich peasants. Bonfires lit up all across the countryside, and feudalism was over. This went on for weeks, and they didn't do any work, with no food in Paris to start with, and no food coming in. On August the 4th, the National Assembly realised they needed to do something to calm the peasants. One guy stands up and says, We should abolish serfdom. It's the only way the peasants will work. And if the peasants don't work, well, we starve to death. The National Assembly agrees and they abolish serfdom, and the peasants return to work. A few days later, Lafayette comes into the National Assembly and says, You know, now that we've calmed the peasants down, shouldn't we start writing a constitution? like you said you'd do in the tennis court oath? They agree, and Lafayette and his American friend, Thomas Jefferson, start to write what will later be known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. It's more of a collection of bills rather than a defined constitution. That comes later. Then they spent the rest of the month debating what powers the king should have, most notably a suspensive veto or an absolute veto. A suspensive veto is when the king can veto a law for a certain amount of time, and if the National Assembly wants to bring it up again, they can force it to pass without the approval of the King. An absolute veto is when the King can veto a bill and keep vetoing it, essentially stopping legislation outright. After a load of arguing, the King was given an absolute veto, and the people in Paris weren't happy. You see, ever since they stormed the Bastille three months earlier, the people in Paris thought they were the centre of the revolution. Not those fancy delegates up in Versailles. At the palace in Versailles, nobody was really guarding it, so on September the 14th, Louis and his war minister go to the National Assembly and say, we're going to call the Flanders Regiment in to guard the palace. The Flanders Regiment is the best regiment in the French army. They were super disciplined and super loyal to the king. But most importantly for the National Assembly, they would be so intimidating that they would stop a mob from trying to form up in the first place because nobody would be stupid enough to take them on. However, by early October, the peasants were still starving, and the price of bread since the fall of the Bastille had gone up by half, and they were starving. When your mother, your brother, your daughter and your son are all starving, you're going to do anything it takes to get a good price for bread. The wives and mothers could only find one place to get a good price for bread. They were going to march on Versailles, and they didn't care how many soldiers there were. They marched miles and got to the gates of the palace, and the National Guard followed them. Because they were starving, it was their mother and their daughter that were also starving. So why wouldn't they follow you? Louis came out and said, I'm actually trying to bring grain to Paris, but there's nothing I can really do. And yeah, I'll go to Paris to be closer to my people. Louis wasn't an absolute king anymore. He was a prisoner to the mob. I think the king knew this, because when he came to his palace in Paris, he goes to one of his aides. Can you bring me a book from Versailles on Charles I of England? Charles I of England was an English king that got overthrown by the people and lost his head at the chopping block. Meanwhile, the National Assembly moved into their new legislative building. And this is really important. At the start of July, the guys in the National Assembly stayed with people from their own counties. However, after six months of getting to know each other, they began to form groups of people that believed the same stuff. So when they moved from Versailles to Paris, they lodged together, and they became more ideological. Out of this came the main political party of the revolution, the Jacobins. But they were still in debt, and Necker came down to tell them this. He said, I know you all care about your liberty, representation, and the nation controlled by the people, but we are still broke. Because food was scarce, and they didn't have enough gold, and inflation was super high, they could only find one thing to back their currency in, land. And who had the most land in France? The church. Meanwhile, Louis, after losing his ability to do anything in war except declaring it, losing his nobles, losing his clergy, not even allowed to go outside the palace, got kind of scared. And in December 1790, he writes a letter to the Prussian king, asking him to please invade the country and destroy the revolution. After surviving an assassination attempt, by June 1791, the king decides this has gone too far. 
but he took his family and the servants with him and they headed to the Austrian border to try and escape. However, they got stopped outside Varenne after a postmaster general saw this massively ornate carriage in the middle of rural France, pulled up to them, noticed the servant's suspiciously large nose, pulled out a banknote, realised, damn, only the king has a nose that big, and took him into custody. They confessed to being the king and queen, fleeing the revolution, and they were taken back to Paris with 6,000 guards. Some radicals in the National Assembly, led by a guy named Danton, who was part of the Jacobin Club, made a speech calling for a republic. A guy named Robespierre, who was also in the Jacobin Club, stands up and says, What's a republic? You can put the king in a tiny box, but you can't get rid of him. He's too fundamental to the state. The assembly was pissed that the king tried to flee on their watch, but they couldn't really do without him. So they made up a lie saying he was kidnapped by a noble paid by the Austrians. But the people didn't buy it. And on July 17th, 50,000 people, led by that same guy, Danton, gathered to ask for a republic. The National Guard came, tensions were heated, and 50 people were shot dead. With the people angry, and the assembly not ready to get rid of the king, they needed something to make the people trust the assembly and the king. So they started a war with Austria. On the 20th of April, 1792. And on the 28th, they invaded Austrian territory. The assembly made the decree that any general that lost a battle would be immediately executed. So a load of generals fled the country, including Lafayette. And on the 28th, the Austrians declared war and said if you touch a hair on the king's head, they will burn Paris down. Even though the Austrians had a king that was at less than a year on the throne, because the French had no generals, they still beat back the French. And within a few months, they were at the gates of France. On the 10th of August, with the Austrians invading and thinking that the king had something to do with it, they massacred the king's guards and took him into custody. And a week later, the Austrians invaded France. With the fall of France seeming likely, two men come together to try and save it. The main guy in the National Assembly, Maximilien Robespierre, and the head of the street mobs and the Minister of Justice, Georges Danton. Because as much as they hate each other, they didn't really want to die. When the fortress at Verdun was sieged and the raid to Paris was left undefended, Danton walks into the National Assembly and makes a speech. The bell we are about to ring is not an alarm signal, it sounds the charge on the enemies of France. To save France, we must dare, dare again, until France is saved. Days after he made the speech, on the 20th of September, the French army and civilians blasted the Austrians out of army. The Austrians, seeing the French singing the Marseillaise, laughing at them, and also hearing the news that Russia was invading Poland, they fled the battle and they never came back. And France was saved. With the external enemies of France gone, the assembly focused on internal enemies, the most important one being the king. The day after Valmy, they abolished the monarchy. Now the Jacobins split in two, with one side the Girondins asking for the king to be spared, and the rest of the Jacobins, led by a guy named Maximilien Ribespierre, now convinced that the only way to save France was to kill the king, called for his head. The Girondins settled on a trial, and the trial began, but on the 17th he was found guilty, and by a vote of 42, was sentenced to death, and on the 21st, Louis was guillotined. Now that the Jacobins executed the king, the people that supported the king went into hiding, and the National Assembly was ruled by the Jacobins. The French kingdom ended, and the First French Republic started, but it wouldn't be easy and the enemies of the Republic were everywhere. Under the guise of protecting its existence, it would become a dictatorship, led by the head of the Jacobins, Maximilien Robespierre. Barely three months went by, when the new government was hit by a revolt in the Vendée, and in response, the National Assembly set up a nine-member legislative committee, the Committee of Public Safety. It said powers over the military, courts and legislature, if the National Assembly was too busy bickering to put down a revolt. It was needed as well because as soon as Louis' head hit the floor, the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrians, Prussia, Great Britain, Spain, the Dutch Republic, Portugal, Sardinia and Naples all declared war on France. With this as justification, 300,000 people were arrested and 27,000 people were executed. George Danton, after seeing how many people were facing France and the fact that they won a few battles, 
Danton said, you know, maybe we should see for peace. I don't think we can win this war for very long. Maximilien Robespierre had him executed for treason. But by June the next year, the French beat the enemy at the Battle of Flexus and advanced into even more enemy territory. So to a lot of people this idea of a military government wasn't really needed. Some of the British invaded at Toulon, but some guys named Napoleon and Carto ended that pretty quickly. During June and July, Robespierre didn't show up to the assembly because he had a mental breakdown over all the people he ordered killed. So people in the CPS started talking. Maybe we shouldn't have all the power. Maybe we should stop the executions. Maybe we should just disband this whole thing. When Robespierre returned on the 28th of July, he made a speech that some members were committing treason. When he didn't name any, everyone thought it was them, and to stop themselves from being executed. Be it known that the Paris Commune, by dint of its actions protecting the criminal Robespierre, is now in open rebellion against the nation. Soldiers under the command of the National Convention have been dispatched to apprehend the traitor Robespierre and his followers. Citizens are advised to remain in their homes while justice is carried out. Be it further known that citizen Robespierre, citizen Henriot, and all of their allies are declared outlaw. Any citizen found to be aiding these criminals will share their fate upon the guillotine. Revolutionary justice shall prevail. The next day, Robespierre was arrested, and a day later, on the 28th, Robespierre and his brother were guillotined. The National Assembly starts drafting a constitution, which would hopefully end the street fighting and the bloodshed. They would create the Directory, and they promised to try and prevent tyranny, bring stability and democracy back to France. Did they? Of course not. This is part of the Project Revolution Club with a bunch of other history YouTubers. If you want to check out some of the revolutions, you can check out the Cynical Historians video, whether the American Revolution was really a revolution at all. If you want to know what happens in France after this period, you can check out Barris' video on the July Revolution of 1830.